do some sort of play acting at times. <laughs> Yeah, All right, now for our less visually dynamic presentation. <laughs> um, ending the silence using new media technologies to overcome alienation in the online classroom. I said ironic because we have no particular technology that's even working at this point. Um, one of the things I was thinking going back to what you all had talked about, this idea that you could only have up to three online classes on your transcript. Uh, really to me relates to, uh, I've taught online for about a decade at this point, and one of the things I run into a lot are a lot of stigmas involving online education. Uh, a lot of that students bring into the classroom, they, they internalize that somehow this is a lesser educational experience for them in the end. Um, I think institutionally it's often reinforced. Uh, just when starting to do research for this, I found a couple interesting quotes, one from President Obama back in 2013, saying in essence that online education, despite being about 30 years old, was just starting to be as good as in-person teaching could be. And the uh, Association of uh, American Colleges Presidents basically said the exact same thing. Well, you know, most of online education still isn't all that good, but some of it's getting there. Uh, and it's no wonder to me that students come into these experiences feeling so negative about it. And to me, that has a lot to do with how the online educational process and system is really thought about. And that's a lot of what I want to talk about today. Um, for me, to make an online class an environment within a college itself successful, you've got to mix the pedagogy itself, but you've also got to mix practice and look at the realities of that. Um, there's a lot of research about kind of ideal situations. And I think all of us can say we've taught Whenever the ideal situation exists, let us know because we'd like to work there. Uh, but of course, in reality, it doesn't. So it's learning adaptable strategies to make these classrooms work. And I'll mention later on how I think this ties to blended learning in a way that isn't necessarily brought up very much. So first, what I'm going to talk about specifically is going to take off from my own experiences, which is teaching asynchronously and in uh, learning management system based software. So Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle, things like that. So there's basically a, a, a systematic technological structure in place that you as the facilitator have to work with them to create your courses. Um, so that's kind of the baseline I'm going at, not real time or anything like that. And there's two key areas of focus I want to talk about. First is design itself. So how does the actual design, the use of technology itself, how does that shape the classroom experience? And the second thing I want to talk about coming out of that is the actual kind of social environment itself that's created by that technology and how important that is for creating a successful classroom, no matter what uh, discipline you might happen to be teaching. Uh, and to that end, there are three key actors I want to talk about. Faculty, um, which is the one that is certainly most researched, uh, tends to be most talked about in general, I think but also students who are incredibly important in creating a successful classroom environment. And also to me, the kind of hidden actors in the system, the administrations and support staff that tend to get very little attention, but for both faculty and students are absolutely critical in making a classroom work, or conversely, making a classroom fail uh, very often. So first, let me talk about the actual technology itself. So first, to me, the most important thing is from a faculty perspective is thinking about how you use technology to create a sense of social presence. By that I mean creating some sort of emotional connection between the participants in the learning community you're building online. And the fundamental thing to that, which every study I found showed that looked at kind of the connection between students, is building conversational space into the course. At the very start of it, not just let's talk about our first unit, Let's talk about ourselves. What brings us to the class? What experiences may we uh, bring into the class that may have made someone want to take the course? Why are people taking the course? A little bit about people's interests and things like that. Building that shows in everything I looked at, that alone increases student satisfaction in a course because they feel more of a connection to it. So it matters more in the end because they feel that level of connection. Another important thing is to assume multiple technologies are being used by students in the classroom. They're not just using laptops, they're using tablets, smartphones, Google Glasses, some technology that kids inventing in their basement today, maybe the next big thing that's being used for a course. But recognize that when you're putting content together, 
that students are going to access it in different ways. So the size of the content, uh, the aspect ratios, uh, all sorts of things will come into play depending on what you're using. And along those lines too, offer redundant content in different forms. And this was something that, in looking through the research that does exist, something that struck me that I haven't found really talk, uh, talked about a lot is that not only is this important in different formats, so a more auditory learner or a visual learner or a textual learner, they can pick the source that best works for their learning experience. Um, but I found it like working with a lot of students with disabilities that, that pretty much all the schools I teach at will get a letter, an email, something like that saying here are the specific accommodations. But those exist because we don't have content more often than not in these different formats, which in and of itself speaks to the fact that those students get a different experience out of the course. Whereas if these are integrated into the course itself, it's not a matter of emphasizing disability, it's also a matter of emphasizing mobility. That students are different anyway, we know that. And it's taking that into account to create, I think, a more sameness of experience that I think is important. And that's something I kind of want to look at more in the future too, ways we can do that. Um, another thing that if you taught online, you probably experienced the ability to limit discussion sizes. As courses, oddly enough, keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, depending on the LMS, if you can do that, say if you're using Blackboard, if you have 50 students, split them into probably three groups, I would say not more than 20, uh, in order to create spaces that are small enough that students can get to know each other. They're not going to build a sense of community when you have 50 people talking all the time, nor is it feasible to expect you as an instructor or student <coughs> to simply follow up with that single group. Uh, from an instructional standpoint, of course, you've still got to grade all those students, but in smaller pockets, it makes it easier to follow different trains of discussion throughout, I think, rather than just a, a single one. And this is another thing, not only does that increase student satisfaction, it also, in everything I looked at, increases faculty satisfaction as well. Um, and again, all this is one of the biggest things in design from a faculty perspective. Just think about what you were doing, how it will affect retention. Again, above all else, it's making students feel a part of something bigger. Uh, from the student perspective, too, uh, make sure that the students come into the course with adequate technology to access the course and knowledge of the learning management system. I think sometimes, particularly as faculty and from the administration perspective, that's taken as a given. But it is not always the case that students, depending on where they are, are going to have regular access or that they necessarily know the learning management system. Um, in a lot of cases, Blackboard, Canvas, eCollege, and such, you should be able to, they have their own tutorials, you can provide students, or again, you can create your own. Just within a YouTube video itself, you can have video, audio, and also you can uh, create captions in order to have basically all sorts of feedback in a single piece of technology right there to help students. Um, the other thing too is, in terms of end of semester course feedback, if you have any control over that, if you can add in something about student satisfaction with the design of the course itself. Again, I found very often that in the schools that I teach at, uh, the uh, feedback forms are based on in-person teaching and don't really make any sense for the type of teaching that we do. So the feedback is only so useful in the end. But to know how, if we have the freedom to structure our courses, students feel about it would be great in, again, evolving our classroom style semester after semester to the specific community we have. Um, for administrators and support staff, supporting faculty above all else is certainly a wonderful, nice thing that doesn't always happen, unfortunately, but specifically making it easier for support staff to engage in the classrooms. Um, and the number of schools I have taught at, and I found talking to other people in teaching-based conferences as well, librarians in particular are under fire, uh, being cut left and right because they're not seen as relevant anymore, apparently. Uh, and a lot of schools because, well, students can just look up what they need. Well, who's teaching the information literacy so that students know how to do that? Um, in the past, you might have had a librarian come in within one of your physical classrooms, you know, give a great talk about how you use uh, library searches or physically going to the library. That can happen now, but that encouragement doesn't seem to be there. I haven't found any evidence, anecdotally or otherwise, that universities are working to build those support staff into courses, particularly research intensive courses, to help students know that those research librarians are there, and again, how to more effectively use the tools at their disposal. Um, and two, for administrators to be present in the classroom at times. 
in a physical space that may be more of a given. But when you're online and you're never physically there, to have a department chair, maybe pop by for a discussion online. All you have to do is log in through a computer. Things like that to create presence and again that sense of community. Um, I'll talk about that more again a little bit later. Um, then comes that pesky reality problem uh, that comes into play. In terms of faculty needing control over course design, great in theory, but there is an increasing push more and more to have courses be standardized. And this gets into learning as a process versus a commodity. More and more, online education seems to be pushed as a way to increase revenue rather than a way to increase learning. Um, and I say that regardless of for-profits or not-for-profits. Um, I've had experience working at both, but even looking through the research as well, it seems more and more online learning is being spoken about, even the quotes I talked about at the start from President Obama and such, and it's economic potential to be more cost-effective education. Not that being cost-effective is a bad thing, but there are consequences when you think about things in purely economic terms and not in learning outcomes particularly, certainly from a faculty and student perspective. Um, the other thing, adjuncties does not particularly lend itself to innovation. Mm -hmm. And um, as this becomes more and more a part-time university system, particularly in the United States, what happens when if you're in a position of an adjunct, you would like to innovate, but you know you innovate, it doesn't work, you get bad student reviews, you don't have a job next semester, that does not encourage one to innovate. It encourage mm -hmm. one to stick as close as possible to something that may not work great, but it works well enough that can at least keep you employed. And of course, the other side that as an adjunct, you always need to look ahead to jobs you may or may not have to have in the future. It keeps your focus partially away from building not only your classroom, but connections with a school that will benefit students in the long run as well. Um, and one other thing just to bring up briefly along those lines is, especially when you're starting off at a new school, students and their cultural, socioeconomic, whatever differences, what makes that school population unique, they're probably not going to know coming into it. So you're going to have to guess a lot in terms of what design is going to work best. And to that, I would say being flexible is the most important thing. If you're not adaptable, if you can't recognize that population and what makes it, what its strengths and weaknesses are, it's going to be very difficult in order to survive there in the long term. Um, and particularly speaking from an adjunct perspective, I teach at one school where it's middle to upper class white students largely, and another that's rural southern. It takes a different approach in those environments, literally to switch on and off at times um, to make the classroom as effective as possible. Next, uh, I just want to talk about kind of that next step from the technology into the social presence itself. Uh, again, Everything I looked at makes it very clear. Effective faculty are those who facilitate conversation between students, but they don't dominate it. Um, and that's somewhat ironic given the setup of this classroom, because it's this setup <laughs> that I would say is the absolute worst thing you can do online as a professor. If you approach it like this, it will not go well. Something more of the effect of a circle, where people are on much more equal terms, um, where everyone's voice can be heard and kind of stands out equally amongst everyone else. Um, again, everything seems to show that's incredibly important for students. Um, and that's where kind of faculty set the tone. So when you have those opening conversations, use uh, uh, pictures. Uh, if you have social media, I, my students will connect them to my Twitter account, which I'll use to do updates, kind of like we're doing for the conference, what's going on, uh, a little bit of kind of that sense of personality. Um, a couple studies I looked at in particular show just a little bit of letting yourself out does a great job for students caring about you in the class more because they see you more as just not that authority figure at the front of the class, but an actual human being um, who has an interest in the material and an interest in them too. Um, and I think, again, it's very easy to forget about doing those small things. A lot of LMSs now, you can put your picture in too, or a little bit of other content as well to help personalize it um, as well. But again, don't ignore those little things you can do. Because again, it appears to make a very big difference in terms of student satisfaction, which leads ultimately to greater retention. Um, another thing that, to the extent that I've seen it studied at all, is that feedback in multiple forms is important. Just like it's important to give course content otherwise, um, imagine many of us have felt the pressure of rubrics. 
And certainly rubrics have their place, but rubrics can also only do so much. A mix of qualitative and quantitative feedback uh, seems to make, again, increased student satisfaction the most. Um, I know I've just started to incorporate audio feedback as well. Or it's not exactly a two-way conversation, but at least it's something that I can add a lot more detail and I can physically type out in the same amount of time to give students a greater sense of the scope of their research projects. Like you might if you were sitting in office hours or something. Um, and that too, for office hours, um, Skype, uh, instant message. The more forms you offer, again, student satisfaction tends to increase markedly, which of course leads to higher scores on student surveys, which getting back to the adjunctive problem helps one maintain their positions in those cases as well. Um, from the student perspective, also, you have to be prepared to be engaged early and often. I imagine many of us have taught online, they find these students who will come and say, I didn't know it was this much work. I thought this was going to be a lot easier. So I wouldn't have to go to class all the time. Um, prepare students at first to know that their engagement is important, not just for themselves, but for everyone in the class. Make that class a success. And a couple studies that I saw that looked at it very specifically did in fact show that um, when students are engaged at the very start, they will do better without question. Um, when they start late, they struggle throughout, their satisfaction goes down, their retention goes down. And when they start early, as faculty, it also proves very helpful to identify when a student is struggling, to help reach out, figure out you know, how to get them back on track as well. And it makes students more willing to come to faculty when things come up, as inevitably do in people's lives, to build those connections. Now, from the administrators and support staff perspective, this is where I think it gets a little tricky and where I found research is particularly hard to find, and probably because from faculty perspective, it's kind of hard to talk about. Um, because I job people um, that uh, you know you can get yourself in a lot of hot water for doing that. So we'll speak in general terms here. Um, make your online faculty feel a part of the department. There's only one study I saw that people were willing to admit that, um, but it is certainly anecdotally, and I'm sure from personal experience, many could attest to, important to feel a part of the school you're teaching at. If you don't feel that connection, how much harder is it to connect with your students and to retain them when you don't feel any particular interest from the department itself in you being retained in the long run? Um, there's kind of a cascade effect that comes from that. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing, pay equal attention to your online and in-person students at one university mm -hmm. that we won't mention. Um, it was actually probably slightly more online than in-person students, but announcements went out all the time. They were only about the on-campus events. There was never any attempt to connect to the online student body. As a result, there were a lot of online students who could care less. They had connections to their professors, but none at all to the department itself. There was no department culture created in the end, not even just between the students in the department, let alone between them and the in-person faculty as well, because again, those connections were entirely absent and there seemed to be a huge blind spot uh, towards that. And to that end, uh, when I talk about this sense of community, and this is where I think blended learning is particularly important, the blended learning to me doesn't need to be just about what happens in a classroom, it's about programming too. It's blending together the online and in-person elements. It's building a broader sense of community. It's to connect the ideas of those in-person students, the blended students with online students to create a collective in the end. And particularly something like the summer where even the in-person students by and large are gone. If you build a virtual community, they're still active over the summer. There's still that connection built. Again, students can feel part of a bigger whole. And again, that is one of the biggest things that I found in everything I looked at that did wonders for retention because students kept abreast of what was going on in the program. Again, they cared. And when they need, needed trouble or were struggling, they had more people to reach out to to help in their peer group alone uh, that made it a lot easier to get through the programs. Um, again, of course, in reality, all these main actors here have multiple responsibilities that make it difficult to engage, or they have stakes that may make them not want to engage in the process, mm -hmm. particularly perhaps from an administrative perspective, because you've got a lot to lose, but very little to gain in trying to build connections with students, um, especially if ultimately their money is coming in anyway. Um, another thing, civility can be a struggle as well. You never know in an online community 
how students are going to react. And one student who, in essence, goes off the rails can destroy the hard work building the learning community in a moment. And this is another thing where administrations and support staff are incredibly important. When such things happen, when their engagement is needed to stop that, uh, they need to act quickly, effectively, and pay close attention to it. Because if they don't, again, it can destroy a learning community in a moment. And all that hard work you've done, it's not going to be rebuilt because students are now quiet and they're disengaged because they are afraid of hate speech, in essence. Um, personally, I haven't had that happen a lot, but it has happened sometimes. And it's a very difficult thing to deal with, kind of that fine line between you know having an open and honest discussion and the sheer terror of what might a student might say and how it will affect uh, the development of that course. Um, and that's one of the things, too, that I taught at schools with courses between five weeks and 16 weeks. Again, in five weeks, it's hard to build a real sense of community. But again, if you can build that between classes, if you build, again, a learning community throughout the school, the department, rather than just within a class, that again, students appreciate that, and it keeps them coming back. Um, and of course, from a faculty perspective, if you can show high levels of retention, that can be a very useful thing as well. Finally, so where does content fit into all this? Well, darn, we just don't have time uh, to talk about every particular discipline out there. But I think that's something maybe in the Q&A to get into a bit more. I mean, my experiences in history, humanities, and film studies mostly. But what I'm trying to lay out here are just general structural components to keep in mind, whatever subject you teach. Uh, then again, from all the research I've done show at least leads to the best potential outcomes. But you've got to be adaptable and flexible no matter what. Um, ultimately, again, through a design that encourages that sense of conversation and social presence, uh, you should end up with increased retention, makes everybody happy, uh, particularly, um, I don't say anecdotally, but I've found that more and more schools are basing pay on how many students you have in the course, that increased retention is really important uh, more and more. So again, everybody benefits. One of the unfortunate, again, realities of the situation. Uh, learning outcomes tend to be better achieved, again, because students are more active in the process and more simply care about the outcome in a different way. Better student evaluations I've talked about. Certainly stronger departments because everyone's talents are being recognized and used and valued ultimately in the end. And finally, getting back to what I said at the start, I think this is critical in rebuilding the attitude against online learning that a lot of, certainly I know my graduates would face, that employers don't value their degrees as much because, oh, oh, it's an online degree. Again, it gets back to the quotes I said at the start, that you know some of the strongest voices in that can be tied into academia in the US, are ultimately like, eh, it's online learning. It's kind of good, it's getting there. Uh, it's no wonder that employers hold those types of attitudes. I think particularly for those of us who teach online, it's important to fight back against that and to show the value of online learning, certainly for the sake of our students, to help ensure that they get what they want out of their education, not just intellectually, but certainly along their futures as well. All right. Thank you.
created much greater sense of cohesiveness and engagement, uh, I think, between faculty as well. And again, technologically, I think putting everyone on equal terms helps everyone feel they're on equal terms otherwise. Um, but honestly, fully online schools seem to get it mixed still. But I think a lot of it also has to do with being an adjunct, as I am in a number of cases, and most of the people I know tend to be as well. Um, that adjuncts in general don't tend to be integrated into department cultures. And when you're an online adjunct, it's mm -hmm. doubly bad. Mm -hmm. You're twice as easily forgotten. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's very risky to speak up because mm -hmm. sure. in reality, it comes with consequences. Can, can I ask, you talked about um, being adaptable and flexible in, in an online learning environment. But I, I think of those courses as um, those courses where you also are kind of preparing your material, in some cases, reasonably far in advance, right? I mean, just, yes. just be able to get through things, which which means you've got to be pretty, you, you can't be nimble in an online environment in the same way that you can be nimble in a classroom and, and where you're getting immediate cues and feedback from students. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, how do you deal with that? I mean, for me, I think it's the ability, in a way, collectively to be more nimble. Um, what I, my general structure is this: we have two discussion prompts in a week, but I call a first take and then a main post. The first take is more of a general, bring your personality and yourself into it. The main post will talk about the content more, but they are only starting points. Whatever students post, that's really where discussion takes off, and that's where students and what that unique group brings out of the content. That's where I will certainly push and guide discussion. And students quickly learn in my courses that you know they're playing off of each other in the end as much as anything else. So to give them the freedom. And I usually you know, say if there's something else we want to talk about, and in papers as well, to do that. And that's something I've been doing more with other assignments instead of, of course, the traditional paper. To say, you know, if you want to do a video, if you want to do a play, if you want to, you know, whatever you want to do, as long as it achieves a learning outcome, I don't care. Do, you know, if you're coming into this from a film studies perspective, then by all means use that. Why shouldn't you use that? That's what your career is going to be. You know, as long as you address those major outcomes of the assignment, by all means do it. Uh, that being said, it's a very terrifying thing at times, of course, to do that because you never know what students are going to do. But that gets into the risk reward. How much are you willing to risk in order for what could be a great reward in the end? Oh, good. No, you go ahead. Um, well, my question is for you both, and I was just wondering, um, when you're talking about the classroom design, uh, how does accessibility and distractibility play into this, mm -hmm. and who does it affect those things? They're very different, I know, mm -hmm. but there are two things that kept popping in my head as I'm seeing all these laptops pop in front of me. The, the distractibility mm -hmm. is a constant problem, right? So many right. professors who say, Put it down, don't bring it to class, turn it off because you, you're too distracted already and I need you to focus your attention. Perfectly valid argument uh, that, that that's true. And I think in students in general because they grow up in a visual world are much more fragmented in their attention. However, everything's a cost benefit analysis, right? And I don't think you can either in, in, in the small large college hide our head in the sand and say, the digital world doesn't exist, we're just going to really be face to face and it's going to be fine. That's not going to be true either. So the first thing that I do, and I have the benefit of being a teacher ed program, so I say to them in the beginning, you are now not a student, but professional. Mm -hmm. And so here are my stipulations for how technology should be used in this classroom. Should you choose to do otherwise, and we have something called dispositions, and you will be assessed based on those dispositions. So when you're on Pinterest and not on the page that you're supposed to be on, and I'm walking around the room and I have a space where I may not like the space where I know you around the room, which I do constantly, Right? You're not going to get to sit in the back row and hide with your computer mm -hmm. and see what's, you know, and do whatever you want on the screen. Okay? So if they're engaged, it's less likely that they're going to, to do that. So if you've got active learning, they're less likely to do that. That's the first step. But the second step is 
need to have them be accountable to that and understand. They choose their adults. I'm not going to be a high school uh, teacher. I'm not going to take their phones away. I'm not going to shut their laptops. But they, that doesn't mean I'm not watching and paying attention. And it doesn't mean there's no consequence. Kevin, um, previously taught the instructional technology process of the teacher education program. One thing that I had done too, so we had a laptop requirement for eight, ten years in there. Um, students couldn't do their work without it, but one strategy that was pretty successful was um, as students were working in their groups, they were assigned roles for the week. So one person in that group was the digital note taker, mm -hmm. one person in that group was the um, glossary specialist. So as new terms and phrases were being introduced, they kind of kept this online glossary. And a couple of other students then, you know, they, they could not, they could close it so that they could just absorb, um, you know, the conversation. And so kind of giving giving the students um, some intentional goals for what they should be doing uh, with their technology. Yeah. I'm teaching one set of things about that cognition. So just using that kind of skills and mind your behavior yeah. and make good choices. Mm -hmm. right. That's a part of being a, a citizen, right? Of being part of a, an environment and, and that doesn't, I'm teaching freshmen, so it's a steep climb in there, but you, uh, but it doesn't mean you don't throw that out there as a goal and work on it for four years and hope by the end that it's true. Um, as far as assessing the students, um, I think it's something for more allowing for it. Well, I'm thinking specifically like in the physical space. Well, in the physical um, space, yeah, because yeah. we have three students from a variety of different, mm -hmm. who have a variety of different physical challenges, mm -hmm. maybe sight impairment, hearing mm -hmm. impairment. Um, and then there's many, many students who have, you know, like their functioning challenges, which might lead to distractibility, but might lead to other challenges in the classroom environment where there's a lot going on. Yeah. So as far as uh, visual impairment, um, while it's one of the things we've been conscious about is uh, placement of digital content and proper sizing of digital content based on the room space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in this scenario too, you've got the digital content that completely covers the whiteboard right. or the chalkboard, mm -hmm. and that doesn't always resonate well with those that are teaching in spaces. But um, more and more of the content being used in the classroom is also pretty well. So making sure that uh, viewing space for that is built into the design, and then also finding alternative ways for writing on the board. I mean, I should have glasses, but I can tell you right now, if I sat in the back of the room and somebody was writing on the board, there's absolutely no way I would see it. So I think you saw the one video, you know, introducing new ways of whiteboarding and writing on the board through document cameras and things like that to, to help with that. Um, we have, we are looking more into some of the regulations for audio, uh, but for students with hearing aids and things like that. In fact, in our new building, um, it's a sports center, but even in there, we've got that built into the design. Um, so we're, we're much more conscious of that, and um, we can, you know, we can consider that for our LMS as well. But we can always do that over there. So I'm curious um, how you cope with the issue of licenses. Um, so, um, you know, love the idea of being able to let students bring all their laptops in to work, but then how do I get the statistical software uh, on everybody's computer, right? And when we do the thing in the class, they want to be able to do it in their dorm room later. We don't solve that problem. Yeah, so, um, that's funny. You should ask, but we're just working on our SPSS license. <laughs> um, 
Um, our current, we also have a virtual lab environment of the lab. So for software that is cost prohibitive or whatnot for students to download and install on their own machines, we have the licenses to install that in our virtual environment. So then regardless of their device, Mac, PC, tablet, whatever, they can log into one of our VLAB computers. And that's worked well. Um, we, however, are now thinking about it. It would be a little more expensive with SPSS, for example, to have them install locally. But that might be the better way to go. So, I'm sorry, how does the VLAB computer work? Um, they log in, um, you install a client, and then uh -huh. they can connect to a virtual computer. So it's, it's like almost like uh, a digital, a, yeah. a, a, a desktop remote type mm -hmm. of thing. Yes. I see. Okay. Yeah. And then the other question for, for both of you is, is okay, if I'm going to sign up for a classroom now, um, most of the time, and let's say I'm going to have my students be working with pencil and paper in small groups, but several times during the semester I want the class to be computer intensive, we doing something in Excel or on a statistical. What classroom do I sign up for? You know, the, the system, that, the old system is that, okay, on those days we're going to move to the computer lab. And, and, and we've talked about that's a real complexity in this process. So you sort of start with the dominant mode and, and I would say you go in the beginning of that. And part of it is we want to have all classroom spaces be as flexible as possible. Mm -hmm. now, some of them are not going to be, right? The GHC lecture spaces are not going to be that flexible, but they serve a specific function. Most of the classrooms are not going to be that way, right? So only a fraction of our classrooms fall into that category. Most classrooms we would rather have the, the mobile kind of seating structure. So there's a room in our uh, you know, new science building that uh, it's, the technology is not uh, flashy and they have a projection system and all that, but they've got these node chairs that are all on wheels and can do 360 degree turns and every single wall space is called a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. Because they want to work out physics problems on the boards, and that team's working in teams on the boards. So they're all huddled here, huddled here, huddled here, huddled here. But then we want to all come back together into a large group and talk about things and maybe focus on particular things, right? So then, because everything is mobile, you just reorient your chairs and and you face the front and and do it that way. So I think it it just you know, you're not going to be able to create a space that fits every conceivable learning structure, but you can certainly create more spaces that are much more flexible than traditional spaces that allow for those, for those possibilities. And part of that is the baseline technology we talked about having a baseline technology in every room, mm -hmm. right? a projection system in every, in every space. And so um, the, the spaces that I teach in are that way. They have mobile uh, tables. I like to have tables because I have them bring their laptops. We use the laptops every day. It's their pencil. But, um, and they work in, in teams. So they sit at table groups and they're in the team most of the time. But then I'm also talking to them at various points. I don't read them to them, right? But there's, it's also a room without a front, so you just you're in amongst them, and they're around you, and I move through space. So it doesn't. I don't have to change it regardless of the various different kinds of pedagogy I use because the space is flexible enough to do that. One of our uh, courses is pretty
a leap of faith on the instructor's part to shift to that model. But I, that's one of the ones that is on the active learning classroom. And I've been talking with her, she loved it. Um, and we go back. So. When you, when you put instructors into an active learning classroom, though, I mean, presumably, you both want them to change their pedagogy to a certain extent to take advantage of, of what the room allows. Um, but, but, I'm, but what kind of preparation do they get? I mean, what kind of work do you do with them? I mean, you talked about a summer institute or something, but what, what sorts of things are you We need to do more of that. Um, we, we definitely need to do more of that. So we did do one um, intentional, when we had our first active learning classroom, we had you know, a summer workshop to introduce faculty to what that might be like. But you know, really, it's not struggling with the pushing the buttons and making the tap work. No. It, it is exactly yeah. what you're talking about. What do I do now with my time? So I'd like to leverage the faculty that are doing it well. So, yeah. so part of that's part of what the digital learning initiative is doing by giving courses, course design grants that might also include working in different kinds of spaces. We're building learning communities that are then supporting each other. Chrissy and I and the rest of our team and many more, even more than that, and the support staff too, are involved in that process. So if you're going to get the grant and you're going to work on teaching in this way, You've got this whole community of people that are working with you and dialoguing and supporting you as you go through that process throughout the whole year. So I just want to um, let everyone know we've reached time, but thank you so much for our mm -hmm. thank you. I do think the pushing the button is important too. I mean, one of the it one of the advantages of only having a few faculty who do this is that the support staff is available to them Sorry, when everybody does it. Like if you're going to do the system in which in which any student.